This program is brought to you by Cable Franchise Vs and generous donations from viewers like you. So, um, seeing the presence of a quorum, I'm calling to order uh, this meeting of the Regional School Committee. Um, when I call your name, please um, indicate that you're present. Um, Mr. Deming. Deming present. Uh, Mr. Harrington. Harrington present. Kenny. Oh, Kenny present. Sorry, I didn't hear you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Ms. Lloyd, Lloyd present. Um, Ms. Seeger. Seeger present. Ms. Spitzer. Um, Ms. Stancer. Stancer present. Um, Sullivan not present. I'll we'll go back, Ms. Spitzer. Uh, McDonald present. I'm present, sorry, just having connection issues. Okay, great. Um, so we are to order. Um, and just uh, for the folks watching at home, we are um, being live streamed on Amherst Media on Channel 15 in Amherst and on Amherst Media's um, website. Thank you to Amherst Media. Um, and now as our first order of business, I'm going to move that we move into executive session to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation of the APEA and AFSCME if an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining or litigation position of the public body and the chair so declares, and I declare, with intention of returning to open session. The move by McDonald, is there a second? Second. Uh, seconded by Harrington, and we'll take a roll call vote. Um, Mr. Demling. Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington. Harrington, aye. Ms. Kenny. Kenny, aye. Ms. Lord. Lord, aye. Ms. Seeger. Seeger, aye. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, aye. Ms. Stancer. Stancer, aye. Mr. Sullivan. Sullivan, aye. And McDonald, aye. So we will now move into executive session. Um, I will take a roll call vote, um, a roll call attendance. Please uh, state present when I call your name. Mr. Demling. Demling present. Mr. Harrington. Harrington present. Ms. Lord. Lord present. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer present. And McDonald present. Uh, Ms. Hoff. All right, I'll call to order this meeting of the Pelham School Committee at 7.04. And I'll start with roll call attendance, Ms. Kenny. Kenny present. Ms. Barlow? Barlow present. Ms. Stancer? Stancer present. And Hall present. And I don't see Ron. Is that okay? I, I, I did let Ron know that the meeting was, he emailed me a couple minutes ago. I said, we're ready for you. So I imagine he's just hopping on. Okay, great. Thank you. Great. Um, okay, so our first order of business um, is to approve the minutes. Um, and uh, a quick agenda change. We actually have already approved several of these minutes. Um, on August 13th, we approved the minutes of July 20th, July 21st, and July 28th. And on August 25th, we approved the minutes from August 6th. So tonight we're reviewing August 13, 20, 25, and September 2nd, 8th, and 9th. Mr. Demling. Did you say July 28th was approved or was not approved? It was. Okay. Um, then my only edit in all of the minutes you mentioned is August 13th, um, page four, which I'm sorry, it's gonna take me a little while to find, but um, 
August 13th, I'm sorry, page seven. Um, I'm talking about clubs and it says Cubs. <laughs> it's just a small typo. That's my only input. Staying on August 13th on page two of August 13th, which is 42 of the packet. Under item six, I believe Obed's name is O-B-E-D. Um, I had a question mark on the page three, the next page, the second paragraph down where it says, um, Dr. Morris said we are tracking the bilingual population to make sure we have relatively situated classes. And I wasn't sure what, I don't know, Dr. Morris, if you remember what you were, were saying at that point. It's regarding the Comenantes program. Uh, I don't. That's not ringing a bell to me. Oh, class sizes. Okay. So, um, balance? so I think CELA was starting. Yeah, I think it was about the balance of the class sizes. Okay. That's right. Well done remembering CELA. <laughs> and a little further down under item eight, um, I, it says Senator Comerford and Representative, um, it should be Blaise, B L A I S. And that's all I had on 13th. Does any, uh, Ms. Seeger? I think you're muted still, Ms. Seeger. Can you unmute? Yep, sorry about that. Uh, page five towards the bottom, the second to last sentence says, Ms. Seeger asks what would happen if the public health data indicates that we should close schools if the data signifies otherwise. I think it was local public health data. Um, I think I was asking about what if you know something so local that it's, it's not represented at the state level yet. Um, not sure how to rewrite that, but maybe just adding local public health data. Mm -hmm. Mr. Harrington. Yeah, on uh, so page five at the top, section B, it says Dr. Morris thanked the committee members for coming out to the outreach event last weekend on South Hadley Road. It was impactful for our Village Park families. Was that? I'm not sure. Was that referring to the east, the one on East Hadley Road, which would have been South Point? So, so that the two changes would be East Hadley Road, and that it was impactful for our South. Or, oh, not South Point, but South Point boulders, et cetera, families. That's all I had. Yep. Ms. Kenny. Um, I actually also found another typo on page seven near the bottom. It says, I think it's supposed to say Miss McDonald, but it says DMS McDonald. So I think it's just, I think it's just a typo. Yes. <laughs> Anything more on the 13th? Uh, looking at the 20th, August 20th. Did anybody have edits on 20th? Ms. Kenny. Um, and under number six, I think it should have been Olympia Oaks and Village Park. The locations of the town hall. Yep. Or the and I had on page four of that same one, um, the second paragraph down, um, is that Miss McDonald said that we would change the language um to upon vote um or uh, when actually i don't know exactly the words but it's when it, instead of from it was going to be from declaration of um, ending of the emergency to um change the language to upon school committee rescinding it uh, and then at Further down on that same page under the description of BEDH, public engagement at committee meetings, that first line, um, it should say this policy updates 
a based unrevised model policy and policy from other Massachusetts school committees. And on the page five, towards the bottom, the third paragraph from the bottom that starts with Mr. Menino asked if we could use a numerical scale. It says, Mr. Demling said that once you make an evaluation, you cannot break any laws. And I'm gonna look to Mr. Demling to, if he remembers what he was saying, this was about the evaluation. Yeah, I, I, and I think the general sense was, um, people were asking what the legal, what you're, who's legally allowed to participate in an evaluation? And then wondering about what you should comment on where, like where you should put the COVID stuff and where you should put the previously established goal stuff. I, was just, I guess I was just making the general point that when you do the evaluation, there's there's no right or wrong way to do it in terms of legal requirements. It's 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 not possible to if you mention COVID and during one of the goal sections, for example, it's you're not you're not breaking any law. I'm not sure how to say that in a uh, <laughs> succinct way. Maybe it's you won't break any laws by answering the survey the way you wish to. Sure. Yeah. Any more on August 20th? I'm seeing none. So August 25th. Ms. Seeger and then Ms. Kenny. I was not at that meeting, but it has me in attendance. I also believe that meeting was a, the 25th was a Tuesday, not a Thursday. Ms. Hall? Oh, actually, uh, Ms. Kenny was first, sorry. Oh, Ms. Kenny, sorry. Well, I was in attendance. <laughs> So maybe that's what happened. And then I also found on page four, um, it says sign, but I think it's supposed to say since. Just a little typo there. Ms. Hall? Um, just to, on the call to order, it has for Pelham, it should show me calling to order the Pelham School Committee, not the regional. On page five of that, the last, the paragraph right above the fall 2020 update, it says Ms. McDonald moved to approve policy, and then it says BEDH. I believe that should be EBCFA because it shows the region approving BEDH twice. So I think if you just change that one to EBCFA, it works. We're good. Uh, any more on the 25th? Seeing none, so we'll move on to September 2nd. Ms. Hall. Yeah, just some more cleanup on the um, calling to order and the various votes. Um, so hang on. And, um, Sorry, in number five, it should say that I called the Pelham School Committee to order. Um, and then down below in the adjourn section, just to clean that up so that Amherst adjourned Amherst um, and that I adjourned the uh, Regional School Committee. I mean, sorry, Pelham, not region. Um, and I believe I see Ms. Kenny is missing from the attendance list on this one as well. And and actually, um, I can't remember the date, but at some point, Ron Menino um, left the region and is only Pelham. And so, and Ms. Kenny is Pelham and region. 
So I believe that should be the August 25th as well, correct? I think that's right. Yeah. Ms. Dancer? Um, I have a couple things. In number three, athletics, in the second paragraph, second sentence, um, I think we need to add, um, where it said MIA modifications, we need to add for cross country. It, it describes modifications, but it doesn't say it's for cross country. And on number 10, in the fourth paragraph, uh, it just, it says virtual form, and I think it should just be forum. I think that's just a typo. Yeah. And then number 11, the fall update paragraph four, the second line, it says face masks, and I believe that's face shields. And I wonder if, because that's a, such a significant donation, if we should actually put in 11,000 face shields, because that, I think, Dr. Morris, that was what you noted. There were face masks. Oh, generation. Yep. That's all I have. And to be clear that that it's just that one line that it should be changed to face shields because the next line is correct that it should be cloth face masks. Yes, just yep. that they were actually shields and they were 11,000 face shields. Any more on September 2nd? No. Moving on to September 8th. Just a little more cleanup. So number six, it has uh, me calling to order the region again. Um, and then down at the bottom, it just needs to be added a section showing Pelham adjourning. There's no, doesn't show Pelham adjourning that meeting. Ms. Dancer. Just a couple of small things. In number three, that first line, it's got last week twice, and I, I think we just need to clean up that sentence and take out one of the last weeks. And then um, in number 11, the fourth paragraph midway down, Mr. Menino asks what presents a student from group A joining group B. I think that presents would prevent. Any more on September 8th? Welcome, Mr. Menino. Okay. So um, our agenda says that we also had September 9th, but I don't think we even met on September 9th. So there, and there's no a, a minutes for September 9th. So. What we are look, what we would be looking for motion on would be to approve the minutes of August 13th, August 20, August 25th, September 2nd, and September 8th. Mr. Demley. So moved for the Amherst School Committee. Uh, I'll second that. So for Amherst, uh, moved by Demling, seconded by McDonald. We'll take a roll call vote. Mr. Demling? Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington? Harrington, aye. Ms. Lord? Lord, aye. Ms. Spitzer? Spitzer, aye. And McDonald, aye. And the motion passes unanimously. I will make a motion for the regent to uh, approve the five uh, meeting minutes as amended. 
Is there a second? second? Uh, moved, by, uh, moved by McDonald, second by Stancer. And we'll take a roll call vote. Mr. Demling. Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington. Harrington, aye. Ms. Lord. Lord, aye. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, aye. Oh, sorry, Ms. Kenny. <laughs> Kenny, aye. Ms. Seeger. Seeger, aye. Ms. Stancer. Stancer, aye. Mr. Sullivan. Sullivan, aye. And McDonald, aye. Did I miss anybody? No. Uh, the motion passes uh, nine to zero. Uh, Chair Hall. All right, I, I'll make the motion for the Pelham School Committee for um, the minutes for those five meetings. Is there a second? A second. Second advice to answer. All right, we'll do a roll call vote. Uh, Ms. Barlow. Barlow, aye. Ms. Kenny. Kenny, aye. Ms. Stancer. Stancer, aye. Mr. Menino. Menino, aye. And Hall, aye. So uh, we will now uh, move on to our public comment. Um, and tonight we have one voice message and one email message um, and they're both related. So I will. Play the uh, voice message now. Hi, my name is Ted Sumos. I live in Montague uh, and am a teacher uh, in Amherst, uh, leaving a public comment today, uh, Tuesday, September 29th. Um, and the comment is a reference to the uh, cluster of cases at, at UMass and uh, the question of, of how that might impact uh, our public schools uh, actions or openings and I just want to really encourage people to think about indoor air quality uh, you know with the the issue that this virus is often passed through indoor air um, I'm gonna send a link to um, uh, to Alice McDonald from an article in the New York Times yesterday about uh, indoor air quality and some simple things that can be done to uh, make it safer regarding uh, virus transmission. You know, as we're getting ready to open up, I think we, it's tough, but we do need to really keep that safety issue in mind at the same time as we are making plans to open up and, and uh, you know, trying to move forward with that as well. Just keeping safety in mind. I think that, you know, the cluster is probably going to uh, grow as, as people look into it more and learn more about it. Um, so uh, thank you for taking my comment and I will send the link uh, via email. Yesterday's New York Times, Monday's New York Times. Thanks a lot, bye. And I will share my screen. Are folks able to see this? So this, uh, this uh, comment document is posted already on our website. If you go to the Regional School Committee Agendas web page, um, the link to this document is there. Um, and for anybody interested, can link to the New York Times article from there as well. Okay. We are right on time. Um, so, we will uh, move on to our superintendent's update. Dr. Morris? 
And I'll be very brief because most of it will be in the fall 2020 update section, but I have a, a nice update I wanted to share that Mark Moriarty, who's a high school teacher, uh, been with us for many years, was recently notified by the University of Chicago that he was selected a University of Chicago Outstanding Educator uh, after having been nominated by high school alum Emilio Levins Page. So we're really thrilled that um, he's getting the recognition for this. And it's great that our graduates still think back to their high school experience uh, with that sense of appreciation for the educators who affected them. Um, so just want to share that. I'll have plenty more to share when we get to the, the agenda topics, but that's my only non-fall 2020 uh, related up, return to school related update. Thank you. Um, so uh, moving on to the chair's update, I actually have two, um, two quick updates. Um, the... I'm going to get, oh, uh, it's the Collaborative for Educational Services um, board meeting is, is this week. Um, Mr. Sullivan um, had been serving as the representative for the Regional School Committee on, on CES board, um, and he's volunteered to continue in that role this year. Um, and I, as for those from the Amherst School Committee, I did put a call out for volunteers um, to serve on that. and. Um, Ms. Lord has volunteered to serve in that cap capacity. So um, assuming the rest of the committee is amenable to that uh, appointment, then Ms. Lord will serve as our Amherst School Committee representative on the CES. <coughs> Great, thank you both for, um, for your service um, in that. Uh, Chair Hall, do you have any chair updates? I don't, thank you. Yeah. Uh, and now we're on to um, the next item, which is school committee announcements. Are the, does anybody on the committee have announcements? Mr. Demling. So I wanna thank uh, Senator Comerford for alerting our committees as well as our local governments to a study that's going on at the state, uh, looking at minimum local contribution. And um, to, to avoid getting totally wonky, the, the roll up of this is that this is an aspect of state aid to school districts um, that is looking at basically how much uh, local districts should pay and how, how much they get back in addition to Chapter 70. Um, hold harmless is a big piece of this. It basically says that if your enrollment declines, that you don't get less than what you got last year. It's a massive component of our funding. If this was lost, Amherst would lose more than 3 million, region more than 5 million. So we're talking about potential catastrophic loss of staff and services. Uh, and there are business groups that are advocating for just that, for the removal of Hold Harmless. And so um, I want to thank your Amherst Town Council. I know that this is on their radar as well. Um, this will maybe come up a little more in our agenda planning, um, Chair McDonald, but I, th I think this is an opportunity for uh, for advocacy. It's kind of a short window. Uh, October 16th is the deadline for public comment. Um, but it's, it's something that is critical to our level of state funding um, and something we at least for a couple of weeks, uh, should focus on trying to get a strong message out. Thank you. Yeah. Dr. Morris? Just uh, adding to Mr. Demling's comment, um, while I don't have a figure, Pelham was, is also a hold harmless di district, so it affects all three districts present tonight. Uh, are there any other announcements from committee members? We are moving right along. Um, so now we'll move on to our new and continuing business and we'll start with um, the fall 2020 update um, from Dr. Morris. Thank you. Um, so uh, it's kind of five things I wanna go over or six things I wanna go over. So I'll try to pace myself, um, but um, I'll share them. Um, one is just an update on the UMass. It was public comment about the UMass cluster. I want to share uh, information about that, uh, information about hotspots and IS, because um, that's come up, uh, about distance learning and how that's going, uh, about ventilation testing, which we have more information about, and just a little bit about caregiver video uh, training and a video that was sent out to phase one families this morning. Those are kind of the, the highlights I want to go over. So uh, I'll go in order. So. Um, I want to thank UMass, um, the administration at UMass, as well as the town for being in touch with me very frequently 
um, and our staff, um, Jill Consolino as well, uh, about the cluster they have there. Um, so I've had daily updates from the university as well as the town since this all started playing out on Friday. And so, you know, we feel good about the communication that's happened. At this point, we're not seeing a resulting increase in the community, which is one of the things that um, the public health folks have advised me that um, not that the cluster is good, but it'd be um, more problematic if you looked at the larger community and saw rapid increase in the non UMass related parts of the town. Um, to date, we have not seen that. It's something we're actively looking at. Um, and so we continue to have communication on that topic. Um, but at this point, uh, it's not something that would, uh, with the data we have right now, preclude us from returning to school uh, in person on Thursday. It is something that um, if conditions change, decision-making matrices may change. And so I want to be realistic that we don't know what we don't know. Uh, but talking to the public health folks uh, in the town and, and university, um, there's not been a recommendation to not open on Thursday with the information we currently have. So we're going to follow that recommendation and our plan is to open on Thursday. I know there was some questions about that. I want to be really clear. Um, I, you know, I don't want to be pessimistic, but again, if, if the information changes, um, I want to make sure it's a conditional statement. We're looking forward to open with the, with the information we have now. If there's a rapid change of information, we'll be communicating that out. But um, uh, the information I got as recently as hour and a half ago from UMass uh, is status quo information and status quo information is good information for us in terms of uh, any, uh, we're more concerned about the new information. The status quo is what we know and that's where we are um, today and we plan to open on Thursday with that. Um, I think to a larger point, it is um, something that we'll have to continue to watch for um, and communicate, continue to communicate with the university and the town. As you know, we've had a transition in health directors in the town with uh, Jennifer Brown. Fortunately, she's been known and worked for the town for a while, um, but we'll have a new health director coming in. But I think, again, that communication and collaboration is going to be critical moving forward. Um, I'm going to skip around, actually. I'm not going to go in order. So I'll go to ventilation testing. So uh, it's on our website now, as well as the committee has received it today. We had our next round of ventilation testing. Um, and the good news was, with the exception of one space at the high school that tested out under four air changes per hour, all the other ones with modifications or fixes to the HVAC systems uh, ended up over four air changes per hour and are ready for use. And the one that didn't is one that we weren't really planning on using much anyway. So that was a, you know, um, that was okay. It was it was going to need major major renovation of HVAC systems in that room. So uh, we had we had, um, we had that concern looking at it after the first round of testing, um, and that's where we are. Uh, the second round of testing also tested the phases uh, the spaces for phase two at the elementary level, um, and fortunately at Fort River at Wildwood and at Pelham, all the phase two spaces tested out over four air changes per hour. Um, Crocker Farm, kind of oddly enough, uh, in the new construction upstairs, um, did have some areas that tested a little low. Um, the ones that were tested, uh, we added a second purifier to those, which adds air changes per hour, and three of the four big classrooms upstairs are now over the four. The fourth one um, still needs work, so the fourth one's not ready for students, but we have a couple weeks for that anyway. It's not, it's not, it's not, they're not classrooms that, um, the, the, this particular classroom wasn't a room that anyone was going to be in starting on Thursday anyway. We've made some updates and some fixes to all four of those classrooms upstairs. You know, one would have expected them to be performing even at a higher level because they're new construction from 2002. Um, but um, when Nexus, our consultant, comes back and tests, we anticipate those uh, being significantly higher from what um, the information I received from our HVAC specialist. Um, so overall, it was really good news. It continued the good news we've, we, we had from the first round, and it was also good news to see that four of the five spaces at the high school were able to be fixed um, and saw a significant up, uptick in their air changes per hour number. So again, many thanks to our facilities um, crew and uh, all the work they do both routinely as well as when we get new information to make fixes and improve the, the ventilation in our schools. Um, those were two pretty big topics and the rest get uh, more about hotspots, distance learning and, and caregiver information. So why don't I pause there and see if there's questions about uh, the ventilation testing or UMass um, cluster information, then I can move on to the other three topics. Questions? Not seeing any questions. Okay, then I will move on to uh, 
caregiver training. So uh, this morning there was a video sent out both in English and Spanish of caregiver training. It's about 15, 16 minutes long. Just what trying to help families with what to expect when they get to school. I did it with Miss Consolino. And so we talked about things like playground usage, uh, meals, uh, health and safety, safety checks, um, all those types of things. We did also share that the great news is that all meals until January 1st are free, whether students are in person or at home because of the, the extension of that um, kind of essentially what was our summer foods program. Uh, we will be serving breakfast uh, at the end of the day and a bag lunch or bag breakfast that students can take home. Uh, because of the later start, we don't want to wait until 9.45 for students to have breakfast. It also uh, creates a lot of um, challenges. We don't want to have food in rooms, so it kind of uh, does well on both of those uh, marks. Um, but we sent that home because we wanted to provide information, and principals are sending additional information to families about specific like car drop-off, bus drop-off, those types of things um, that are more building-specific. But we're trying to communicate as much as we can with families ahead of Thursday because we know that there's a lot of questions, and um, so far, so good in terms of some nice feedback that uh, they felt like it was it was the right information that they were looking for uh, before the return to school. Um, in terms of hotspots, we've ordered more and we're collecting and they should be coming in soon. We did find a vendor who can get us them relatively quickly. Um, it's a pretty small number of families who are still needing um, hotspots, um, but we are uh, able to provide them as much as we can. And I think we just asked that um, if folks need a hotspot, that's great. But really, these are these are intended to be earmarked for families that don't have their own Wi-Fi. Um, you know, we had a little bit of conflict around that with families I know who would help versus families without internet access, but we're trying to support for all. Um, so really at this next round, we do have a handful of families, um, who are still struggling with, with consistent access. And so that's going to be the next round uh, that we get. And we expect those in within a week and we'll be able to provide those. Um, see there's a hand up so I can pause. What exactly is a hotspot and how are they installed? Yeah, so that's a great question. So the nice things about Hotspot, Hotspot is essentially creates a um, cellular network in your in, in someone's home or in a space. So uh, it's kind of like what your cell phone, sometimes people use cell phones as hotspots. So it, it is able to uh, provide that. And the nice thing is it's just plug in and play. In other words, it doesn't require complex setup uh, because it's really just creating a, a kind of local network where your Chromebook can log into. So it's not installed in a parking lot, it's installed in a home. It could be, I mean, there are some places that have hit large hotspots that are installed on buses that go to um, high density housing. I've seen that in urban areas, not so much in the Northeast, but in other parts of the country. Uh, but these are, I don't know, they look not much different than like a charging pod. You know, if you've seen the charging pods instead of something that plugs in. Um, so that, that's what it is. And the challenge we have is that in some areas that don't have cell phone coverage, then a hotspot's not going to work. Um, so there are, you know, we're in much better shape with that, but there are some places in our catchment area or for families whose children may be between two homes or Mr. Sullivan's home um, and um, where hotspots won't work. But for the majority of our families, they've been very successful, hence the demand that we have this year. Um, but it is worth noting that if, if anyone lives in an area where there is not a hotspot, if there's not cell service, the hotspot is feeding off the same technology. So that'll be a challenge. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Sorry. I should have explained that more clearly. I know it's weird things we learn during this time. Um, and so, um, Ms. Spitzer. Um, just a quick question. I I know the initial round of hotspots were all purchased through very generous donations from a lot of the families in our community. Are we able to purchase these additional ones using the CARES money? Or yeah, exactly. And the, per the yeah, the CARES money. And, and the purchase actually isn't the big cost. It's the monthly fees that are the large cost. But we were able to negotiate a deal with Verizon, who's doing, um, which is our vendor, and they're doing deals with schools that actually significantly reduce the cost from what we were paying prior our front and unlimited data plan. Districts that have not used an unlimited data, they find out that, you know, two hours into Google Meets for the day, everyone's maxed out just because it it, it pulls so much data. Um, so that was really the only option that was feasible to support students without um, reducing their access. Any other questions? No? Okay. And my last one is an update on distance learning. Um, I think the rollout um, 
has gone incredibly, I believe, and the feedback is from all stakeholders, gone incredibly smoother than what we experienced last spring. Um, but both, and I want to thank our staff, teachers, paraeducators, and others for their incredible work because it really is incredible to uh, to think about what it takes to be an effective teacher in a virtual environment is really different than what anyone was fully trained on. Uh, we did do significant training over those 10 PD days um, at the beginning of September, uh, and I think the training was high quality, but it's, it's one thing to do a training, another thing to put it into action. So we have gotten some uh, significant amount of positive feedback, including from families who felt like it was uh, the spring was pretty isolating, you know, and unsuccessful for their children. Uh, by no means is it, do I think it replaces in-person learning for all kids. Um, I think that there's kids, there's children and students who don't have access to the distance learning. It still has implications for families. I want to be really sensitive to that, that it's, it's uh, especially for families of young kids and, and families of um, students who require a more adult support. Uh, we do have some examples um, as we negotiated with our, our bargaining unit of um, or have uh, other folks, uh, consultants who are doing some in-home work for students who are um, with more intensive needs. It doesn't necessarily fit, fit all the students, but we are trying to meet students' needs, even if it's supporting their access to distance learning. Uh, we've gotten some positive feedback that that's made a difference. Um, we also have some on-site things happening. So athletics, you all voted um, as a, a collective body. Um, but we are also working with the theater arts department who are working on planning some uh, outdoor experiences for students uh, as it relates to performing arts. So we are seeing more and more, um, even before Thursday, opportunities where school staff and students, at least in, in some limited ways, uh, are able to connect in person. So um, really want to thank also our kindergarten teachers and others who did in-person uh, student orientations. I think I mentioned last week, I got to see one. I'm not sure I mentioned it here. And it was just, it, it was fantastic to see the relationships already being formed and how the safety measures were part of that uh, kindergarten orientation, but they weren't the whole thing. Uh, it was happened to be at Wildwood, but that I was walking up uh, and got to witness a part of. So uh, we are making uh, strides and I'm glad we're using a phased approach and really easing into um, that in person, because I think it's from a capacity perspective, it makes a lot of sense. Um, but that's sort of where we are with things at the moment. Um, but really just want to thank everyone for um, their embrace of distance learning, our staff, and how much uh, outreach and family outreach um, is going on. I think, you know, put succinctly, the two of the biggest complaints last year were not enough synchronous learning and not sure where to go in terms of where, you know, how to get on. And how do I meet my teacher? And our staff have risen to the challenge, I think, to be um, doing significantly more synchronous learning. I know that. And also to supporting families with much more um, structure and organization of where to find resources um, and supporting students and dependents. So, again, just big thank you to all of our staff for their work uh, with the you know two weeks in um, to distance learning for this year. Mr. Demling. You think I know how to unmute myself by now. Um, so, um, so thank you for the update. Um, so two process questions for you on the continuing um, bargaining with the uh, APEA on the memorandum of agreement. So from my understanding, the process is um, when bargaining concludes, there'll be a draft MOA that the APEA then votes on the whole membership. And if that passes, then the school committee will vote on it in open session. Can you, can you give us an update on the status of, of, of that whole process? Yep, so we are at the place of a tentative agreement with the APEA. Uh, their voting will happen, my understanding is, um, this week. Um, and if it's affirmative, then the school committee can consider that next week, uh, next Tuesday night. Mr. Demmer. Okay, so related, what is this document public now so the public can review it? And, and if not, why? And, and the reason I ask is that I presume that that if it passes APA successfully, the school committee is going to want to vote on it ex rather expeditiously. Um, certainly not going to want to delay it further. Um, and 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 the public is going to want an opportunity to read, digest it, and then potentially give us feedback um, process-wise, right? So we it, it can't just be made public like the day before the school committee meeting. So is it public now? And, and if not, why and, and and when will it be made public? Yeah, so I did check in with the attorney for the district on this topic this afternoon, and and the perspective I received was that 
Um, until it's voted by both parties, it's technically still in negotiations. While we're not actively in negotiations the way we were before a tentative agreement, um, it, until it gets voted is considered uh, like anything else that would be uh, a confidential document. Um, I think we've released some of the information with a joint statement with the APA on September 11th. We released that. Um, but that's the understanding that he shared with me um, this afternoon because that question had come up. Um, and um, that's the answer I got. Is this a follow up, Mr. Demling? It's, okay. Yeah, so, okay, so I appreciate that, and I appreciate that we need to be legal. So just so just to clarify, um, so some details were shared in that statement, joint statement. Are there other details that can be shared? Or, like, what, what's the line? You know, like, I guess I'm just asking if it's process-wise, right? Like, mm -hmm. because there's obviously a, a lot of the public that is anxious to understand the details, and so... If there's components of that that's legal, that's understandable. But is there no other com like summary? I'm just if I'm a member of the public and I'm watching this process, do I just wait until the school committee votes it and then I find out what's in the agreement and and potential impact to you know phasing and metrics and all sorts of other things? Or like I guess you know from a point of view of the public, what's a, what's what's the information flow sequence going to be? Sure. So phasing and metrics were, were and I'm not picking on you, Peter, but those are two things that were you know two of the things that were shared out, um, probably the two things that were shared out. Um, and my understanding from, from legal counsel is that uh, what would happen is the sequence would be the school committee would get um, a final draft MOA. Uh, it'd be voted by the, you know, and that would be shared with the committee. Um, and then as it was talked about in the executive session next Tuesday and voted, it would become a public document when both parties have voted it in um, and not necessarily before. You know, and that's something certainly, you know, I'd be happy to follow up or you could follow up with the chair and legal counsel. But I, that was the response I got from um, our legal counsel this afternoon. Thank you. Thanks. Anybody else have questions about um, distance? Mr. Uh, Mr. Sullivan. I think you're muted, Mr. Sullivan. I am muted. So it's the exact opposite of distancing. I haven't got to ask about transportation in months. So now, <laughs> so now I was, I'm just curious because in the spring, we negotiated with our two bus companies at that point because they weren't running. And I'm just curious since they're not run, since Five Stars are one company now. And they're not running full. Are we still getting a discount, or once they start to run that on Thursday, that's it? They're full contract. Thank you. Yep. So that is going to be a topic on Tuesday night. With Dr. Or Slaughter has been talking to Five Star around that. And even though we're not running full, they're also supplying some bus monitors for us and and other things. So uh, look out for that conversation next Tuesday. Miss Spitzer. Thanks. So I um, just want to start off by saying thank you to everybody. I, I have noticed like a huge improvement in distance learning from um, my perspective as a parent and also just from, you know, conversations with other parents and families and caregivers in the district. So um, my second question is just, um, I think it's great that we approved um, sports and we've approved um, theater, you know, or, or not that we've approved theater, but that you just shared with us that theater is potentially happening. These are all for high school and maybe middle school students. Um, and I know that you, you did mention the in-person, um, but there are, you know, all the folks in phase three are potentially not having any real in-person connection. And, you know, like our fourth and I think it's fourth, fifth and sixth graders, or maybe I'm getting it wrong, but I'm just wondering if there's any thoughts in the works about trying to have some in-person connection for them, or maybe they're too young and all the transportation issues are complicated. I'm just curious if there's any new thinking on that. Right, it's hard. Yeah, we have talked about that. And I think it is, what's hard is there's not existing structures along that same dimension. What's a little easier at the secondary levels, athletics existed, after school drama existed. Um, so one of the things we did and starts tomorrow for the young kids and a couple Wednesdays is we did try to partner with outside organizations to offer like this, and not that this is a perfect fit for everyone, but um, 
free soccer clinics um, that are going on the next four Wednesdays. Um, uh, they're at Fort River, but for, they're for any students in the district who, who want to register. So we are trying to think of ways that we can access um, community-based resources to provide some vehicle for elementary age students to be in person. I know that's not the same as, as interscholastic athletics, or um, it's certainly not the same as, as drama, but it was trying to think about how do we um, provide an opportunity for students. And based on an email I got a little while ago uh, before the meeting, they have 30 students uh, registered, which is all, I think it's just K-1 and 2 or something like that, um, for the, the the younger children's soccer, which is a fair number of kids who are going to be able to participate. So we'll continue to look for opportunities where we can partner with community agencies um, to provide opportunities. It's not quite the same, but it's hard to sort of invent um, opportunities that weren't there to begin with in terms of the after school programming. Uh, I know some families have also uh, started to organize because we have that long lunch recess block uh, up like kind of uh, what's optional um, playground times, you know, at Croft Park or other places. And, and so I want to thank families who are trying to connect uh, their families with uh, in their classes with some of those times as well. But, you know, if there's other ideas committee members or community members have, please send them my way because it's, uh, you're, you're right, it's the same timeline as it would be at the secondary level, but um, there's not the same kind of resources that are typically given uh, or structures. Ms. Dancer? Um, so you've mentioned the performing, the, the after school drama, performing arts, and I know clubs are not academic, but is there any update on any kind of club activities besides the performing art for the middle and high school class? Yep, so the clubs are looking for um, advisors. Some of the clubs have started meeting there. Most of them are meeting in a virtual context, but um, yes, um, clubs uh, are getting going. And Liz Haygood, who does incredible work at the high school, um, actively is looking for volunteers for club advisors and things like that. So uh, we are in the same at the middle school um, as well. So we are actively uh, looking to su supplement um, the academic day that way. Um, for most of those clubs, it's, it's likely to be not in person because we can, <coughs> excuse me, simulate that experience and most of the clubs, if you meet for 40 minutes and you live in North Shrewsbury, as Mr. Sullivan uh, walks out, but I was, a, I was a plug for him, you know, at some point you're driving just as long as the actual activity takes place and, you know, that's a barrier. Um, so we're trying to think about what logically makes sense there. Are there other questions? So I just have a one question on um, going back to the distance learning update. We talked a little bit about this, I think, at our last meeting um, or a couple meetings ago about the the uh, students who are choosing all remote learning and the potential that they might be oh, in yeah. classes with um, students from other schools or teachers from other schools. Can you talk to sort of how that's playing out, how many students are impacted by that? Yeah, so the short story on that is uh, just to review is that we don't have enough. Um, well, we looked at how many students across our four elementary schools um, wanted a remote placement, and it generally is two or three classes full of students um, in each grade level, and we have four schools. Um, so it meant that some students who chose a remote placement will be in classrooms with students from other elementary schools. And, you know, and I think that's, that's been, that's worked well in some cases, in other cases, it's felt harder. Uh, and I want to acknowledge that fact in terms of like specialists and others and the connections. And so we're actively trying to problem solve, <clears throat> excuse me, that with families and try to think up creative solutions. Um, so we're only at K and one now. So the next, next, uh, decision would be for second and third grade, but the same trend is going to continue. We, we're going to try to get most of students with a teacher at their home school, and we'll still be able to do that, but it won't be everybody. You know, for instance, in Pelham, there's not really a lot of great options there, and uh, we're still trying to problem solve one particular um, challenge that we have in Pelham in the, as we get towards, not in K and one, but as we move up. Um, so it is something like I was looking at Wellesley and, the, you know, maybe we could have 
uh, modeled or uh, named it better. They call it their district remote academy, and and we weren't willing to go there because we'd like it's to use a overused word uh, like a hybrid model where we're trying as best we can to keep students within a uh, teacher from their home school, but it, it, we're not 100% effective because the demand and the needs aren't quite lining up um, from our placements and, and, and staff members. So um, I think when we get to next week's meeting, we'll have more information about second and third grade and I'll be able to share it there. But but it is hard and we are you know receiving some people feeling like it's working pretty well and other people who uh, are more challenged um, by that. You know, kindergarten's a little bit easier in some ways because they don't have pre-existing relationships with the staff. Um, first grade um as excuse me first grade has been a little bit more challenging and for second and third grade where they have long longer term uh, established relationships with their teachers we're trying to be thoughtful and also not add uh, you know if we were able to add a teacher or two to every grade level uh, at elementary school we could make it all work but you know that'd be a couple hundred thousand dollars that, that we don't have um so but we're doing our best to try to match them. Uh, we're taking that feedback, trying to come up with some positive, uh, creative solutions, um, particularly with uh, grade one, a group of grade one students at Fort River that's been, um, um, you know, we're hearing their feedback and none of it's about the educator, it's about the structures and um, trying to problem solve as we go. Good. Thank you. Any Final questions, comments from the committee? Committees, I should say. Okay. Good. So uh, we'll move along to our next item. Um, our agenda is um, Title IX policy updates, uh, GBAA sexual harassment in the workplace and JICK sexual harassment of students, first read and discussion. Um, so just as a reminder for policy, we always bring them in, uh, bring them uh, any changes to the committee for a reading and a discussion and any changes or edits. And then we come back. We don't vote until at least a second read. Um, these particular um, policy updates, the proposed policies in your packet um, earlier in the summer or late spring, um, the uh, guidance from the federal government on Title IX um, was, was changed. We got new sort of direction on, on that. And so um, as a result, our policies had to be updated. These were effective. The new guidance was effective, uh, I believe, August 14th. Um, so the policy that's in your packet is actually language that was uh, proposed and recommended by our attorney based on the requirements of the of, of of this directive um, on Title IX. Um, uh, Ms. Spitzer and I reviewed these, um, both of our current policies on sexual harassment, so GBAA and JICK, and in looking at them and comparing them to the proposed language from um, Attorney Mark Terry, um, what we're recommending is instead of updating each individual policy, that we create a new policy that replaces, so we'll retire the two policies, GBAA, JICK, and replace them with this new policy, um, which would be ACAB. Um, and for folks that um, are paying close attention to policy, um, the other harassment, more general harassment policy that we just um, uh, voted last school year um, is also in that same section of the policy handbook. Um, Ms. Spitzer, did you want to add anything? I know you spent some time reviewing this. No, I, I think you did a good job of summarizing. And I think the nice thing about this is it'll kind of consolidate our, we, we have a lot of policies. So I think when there are opportunities for us to have a consolidation occur, I think it's, if it's appropriate, it's, it's a good thing. And I think this is an appropriate instance. Any, um, uh, yeah, Ms. Stancer? So, just so I understand, is this language pretty much the same as what was in the other two policies, or do you have, um, is there significant language change, and if so, where? 
Um, it is pretty substantial change. Um, so, which is why we're, we, um, and actually I apologize, we should have included the existing policies that these are replacing just as reference documents in here. Um, I will send those out to everybody after, um, after this meeting. So you can have the links right there and don't have to go searching for them. Um, but it was pretty substantial replacement. Um, so rather than do the markup of everything that was changing, because it literally would be entire paragraphs, um, we're <laughs> just the same replacement. Um, yeah, it's pretty substantial. Okay, thank you. And seeing the old ones will be helpful. Yeah, it does, it does follow um, very similar flow and content. It's just the wording is different. So um, the introduction definition of what constitutes sexual harassment those definition, um, the, the definitions sort of, I don't know what page it is here, but examples of sexual harassment are very similar to the examples. There's just many more. Um, okay. And then also more clarification um, that sexual harassment is not, um, does, is not based on gender or different genders or same gender. Right? So there, there's just more sort of, clarification and definition in this new policy. Right, thank you. As well as, I think the other key thing is, because it's highlighted in yellow, is the requirement that we name somebody specifically as the Title IX coordinator for this. Um, is that correct, Dr. Morris? Yes, we, we, we have that in place already, but um, it's more explicit um, in the policy. Um, but, you know, we've gotten legal guidance that we should have that years and year, for years and years, so we do have that in place for it currently. Any other thoughts, questions, comments? Ms. Kenny? Um, so I noticed a couple of places um, it calls out uh, he or she. Can we either replace that with they or just add they them into there so everyone is feeling included? I, I like that change set. Any other thoughts? Okay. Uh, if there's no other comments or questions, then are we ready to move on to the next item? Okay. So our next item um, is uh, the 2020-2021 goal guidance. Um, and also in your packet, I, I sent it by email, but it's also in your packet, is um, a document that uh, the Chair Hall and I and Vice Chair Stancer and Demling um, pulled together to help, help our conversation. And it's not intended to be a statement of these are the priorities that, that we're saying. It really is to help us start the conversation. We're a large group, um, it, it, you know, and usually we, we sit around and have an informal conversation and discussion about what our priorities are. Um, and then Dr. Morris will take that input and draft um, uh, proposed goals uh, for, for the school year. So this, this, the intent in this document is to jumpstart that discussion um, and provide that sort of framework for um, for us to talk about priorities. We included this year's goals because I, 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 I don't know with the Pelham um, uh, evaluation, but for several of, of the goals for the region and Amherst school committees, um, they were, they were uh, not completely completed because of the COVID and school closures in the spring. 
So we wanted to sort of just hold on to those and keep sight of those as we talk about what our priorities are for this year. Um, and then if you look at the second page of that, we, we um, included some guiding principles about sort of why we're having this conversation with all three committees, the joint committee, um, and sort of high level um, principles as we talk about what priorities we want to see included in the superintendent's goals. Um, and I'll stop talking and let Chair Hall or <laughs> Ms. Stanzer or Mr. Demling um, add any thoughts or comments to tee this up. No, I think you did a great job. <laughs> <laughs> Then I'll open it up to anybody else that would like to um, share their thoughts on priorities. Ms. Lloyd. Thank you. I, um, I have sort of two questions. Sorry, I just ran into my bedroom to plug this in because I was gonna die. So I'm out of breath. Okay, one was around, in the regional it has diversity listed as a goal but for Amherst, which would impl which means elementary, it's not listed. And then it's listed again for Pelham. So I'm just curious about, are, are there a maximum amount of goals you can have? Because Amherst had five, but we don't have diversity in there. That's the first question. And the second question, when we mentioned wellness in as two of the goals, it's, um, it's inclusive of the LGBTQIA plus, you know, being open and affirming, trans affirming. So like wellness is also anti-racism and anti-classism and, you know, anti, but diversity and equity is also LGBTQIA+. So I'm just curious about how we decide where we place the priority or the goal in terms of inclusivity. So I think your first part of your question was looking back at last year's goals. Um, so the first the first page and a half is is just listing what we had as goals for last year. So um, <laughs> did we lose did we lose Ms. Lord or or are you still there? Probably what. Um, I, I think just for the for the group, one of the things. So I'll I'll just read what the, one of the reason the key thing about the guiding principles is that we. we and it, it's kind of related to Ms. Lord's observation about the number of goals and sort of the differences across the different committees, um, uh, which is that we wanna share the goals across the three districts as much as we can um, to make the total effort more manageable and achievable within this school year because we know, welcome back. Um, <laughs> um, uh, so what I was, I was um, Speaking to the first bullet point under our guiding principles, Ms. Lord, which is about sharing the goals across the three districts and why we're having this conversation with the three committees. Um, it's going to be a challenging um, school year um, with a lot of work ahead. And so we wanted to make the total effort for the superintendent more manageable and achievable. Um, and frankly, as you rightly noted, we had a lot of goals last year that was that were different or slightly different across the three districts. Um, so what our hope is, is that maybe we can make it a little bit more streamlined um, for the superintendent this year. Um, and then we also wanted to moderate the scope, knowing that the year is going to be challenging and unpredictable. Um, so really thinking through what is potentially feasible, given that we may be in another emergency situation and at some point in the year. And that that's not a statement of fact. I don't can't read the future. I'm just making a comment that everything that we're doing this year is to be prepared for if we have to go back to 100% remote. Um, and on to your uh, next part of the question. Um, I can't speak to what our thinking was a year ago when we drafted the goals for each of the committees. So I don't really, I think, it, I think part of it has to do with what are the specific initiatives and actions that we're talking about um, with, within each of those buckets and how do those bucket into sort of a larger theme that we can wrap into a, one larger goal. Um, so it's not necessarily to say that one doesn't belong in both, it's what are the specific initiatives in that particular year. Um, and so we can, you know, when we look at sort of the, the list below, 
this is just a proposal. We can move them around however we want if we think that the the, the right initiative when we're talking about diversity and, and anti-racism really belongs more with sort of a, a wellness um, emphasis than anything else. We, we can absolutely do that. Or both belong with both. Right, right. <laughs> thank, you for the, thank you for the clarifications. Mr. Denling? Yeah, I, I guess, you know, the other thing that um, came to mind as we were going through this exercise of what are potential goals for the upcoming year was, was and this is why in the guiding principles, we attempted to put that not all top priorities and projects need to be defined as goals every year. Because if, you know, if you go down to the, um, the priority values and themes, you know, it's, it's not like, it's not like we expect, like say wellness isn't, for example, isn't called out as a goal specifically, it's still a top priority, right? We still expect the superintendent to be focused on it. We still expect progress in that area. It's not like wellness is done or it can be parked for the year. It's like, it's still, it's still a, a focus of, of activity. And the same thing with budget and capital planning and diversity and, um, and all those things. And so I, I feel like, um, so this is like my fourth time going through, third or fourth time going through this, this process of goals. And so I, I, feel this, I think there's this natural tension point of wanting to elevate everything that's important to us into a goal. Whereas if, if, if we do that unbounded, we end up with what's been happening in the last three or four years, which is this really large set of goals. And it's, it's similar to even for specific projects. So like the elementary building project, the Amherst level, obviously very important to us. I fully expect that to have the superintendent's priority, priority attention when needed. That being said, does it have to be called out as a superintendent goal? every single year until we cut the ribbon? Maybe not, but we still expect their attention, right? And so um, I think it's it's just, I don't think there's a right answer one way or another. I just think it's 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 a, a food for thought and and maybe, um, maybe helps the committee feel a little better about having a smaller number of goals if we know that if one thing isn't called out specifically, it's, it doesn't mean it's not getting priority attention. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd actually, if, if Dr. Morris has some some input on that, um, I, I, I'd like to hear that just process wise about, about what, what is helpful. And because this is really kind of a communication device, right? Between the school committee and the superintendent about what your focus of activity is and how we'll evaluate you, even though there is obviously a greater scope to your work than, than just what's in the goals. Yeah, if that's okay with the chairs um, to jump in, I think that's right. I think, um, here's what I'd say. I think the thing, the fewer things that are identified as goals, the easier it is to put regularly on agendas and the easier it is for the committee and the, and the staff, myself, but others as well, to really be focused on. And I think when we've had so many goals that we try to integrate it on agendas, and that means people are getting you know quarterly or less updates on the goal areas because there's other things that go on routinely. So I think uh, for me, it's helpful, you know, that, um, uh, appreciate the organization of the document, by the way, for folks who put it together, um, but that not all priorities, the, the part that was raised earlier, need to be defined as superintendent goals, because ideally, the, the, the few topics that are superintendent goals really define a lot of the agendas that are being set, and when we have too many goals, then we end up have too many agenda items, uh, and we all, you know, you, let's say this delicately, you know, uh, we've been in places where we have too many agenda items. And then when agenda items get, we get to them at 930 at night, it doesn't feel like we're prioritizing them, even though the goal of the point of making them a goal is that they are prioritized. Uh, I'd much rather have um, fewer goals, knowing that you're going to get routine. Uh, everyone's going to get routine superintendent updates on, on all the things, but uh, that we could, the committee's able to dig in. Um, and I think one of my pieces, just in terms of reflective feedback, is um, when we have more goals than we can manage collectively, it doesn't feel like the committee ever gets to dig in on them because we're going from goal to goal to goal and rotating them through meetings. And, and that has felt really unsatisfying, I know, to the committee um, to get updates intermittently, even if they're good updates, but it doesn't really let uh, the committee, you know, ask relevant questions and come back to a future meeting that's rem that's remembered by the time you get back to it uh, with follow-up items and tasks. So it's a long-winded way of saying, I think less is more. And I think quality over quali quantity uh, from the committee makes sense. And that's not at all saying the committee can't ask on other, thing, other projects that are really important um, to have routine updates on them. But I think if we can agenda, calendar the items, 
and have them come back frequently, it ends up being much more rich conversation and the committee can um, can feel like they're they're getting informed and inform, you know, that two-way street that we talk about, uh, that it's possible. Um, so I'll stop talking, but, but just wanted to emphasize that point um, that it's not it's not everything I'm doing and it's not everything even that the committee can ask for updates on. It's really trying to define some key key goals um, that, that the committee feels like they want to get routine updates um, and not just updates, but actually engagement in throughout the year. Um, Ms. Dancer and then Ms. Spitzer and I saw Mr. Harrington, you had your hand, so we'll go. Stancer, Spitzer, Harrington. <laughs> um, I'm thinking, looking at this, um, I don't know how other people felt, but in doing evaluation this year, this time, it was really difficult because we had goals that were in different buckets, and so we had to write about them in different buckets, but they really were interrelated. And so it, that was very difficult, I found, in some cases. And I feel like this might help with that aspect when it comes time to do the evaluation. So there was something that was in wellness, and there was something that was also in diversity, equity. Um, but but the initiative projects, I mean, these are really specific things, kind of, it seems to me anyway, pulled out of the, the priority values. And so I don't know if that makes sense, but it just seems to me that looking at this may help us be able to do better with the evaluation as well. Mm -hmm. Ms. Spitzer? So I have first a reaction to Ms. Stanton, but I guess I'm not supposed to respond directly. <laughs> but um, I guess one thought about uh, that, that that was jogged when in response to that was that we have to tie this to the rubric. So it, it there there is a DESI kind of set of um, I'm going to get the wrong word, but there, there's a rubric where there are certain categories um, and, and usually what we need to do is go back and tie whatever the goals we are, you know, to, to this rubric. I think it's four stand, standards is what they call them. So there are the four standards we need to tie these to. So part of the awkwardness of the evaluation is a function of the, um, the structure that the state puts in place. So I don't, I don't know if there's a way to, I mean, I don't want the state's process to be leading our goal setting. I think we should set our goals to reflect what our community needs, but it does kind of create this awkwardness when we're, when we're doing the evaluation, which I'm not sure how to get around, but maybe we could talk about over the course of the year to think about a little bit more. I guess, um, oh, go ahead. No, sorry, I, yeah, I'll, I'll respond later. Okay. It was okay. about the evaluation, finish your thoughts. <laughs> So then I had some reactions just to, to the, the initiatives and projects. And I, I do like this way of putting down some priority values and themes. I, I think that's great. Um, when I look at the initiatives, I, I think, well, first, just a quick reaction to the early education. So I think it's almost like instead of saying increasing access, I honestly think we just need to maintain access. Like I'm honestly in this place of, you know, the, where I've, Anecdotally, it seems at least that we are in fact actually losing slots in, in some of the early education. So I don't know if, 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 you know, maintain or increase maybe should be the language there because I think honestly, if, if during these times we can just keep the number of slots that we have available, open and available to our kids, I think that'll be um, success. I'd like to see more, obviously. Um, and then um, I feel like there's some sort of connection between the strategic planning and the COVID changes. And, and I honestly think at this moment in time, if I were to say what I'd like to see in six months or, you know, nine months, but I'm not maybe getting my math wrong, but, you know, at the end of the year, it's, it's not so much that I, I feel like the visioning we were doing, it's not that all of that should go to the wayside, but it's almost like I'd like to see instead active reflection on what happened this year and how we responded to this crisis and what in what ways does this totally disrupt how we've been doing things and where we can potentially see opportunities? Like, I, I know I have a feeling Mr. Devlin might have been behind a later start time, um, but um, there are also things like, you know, outdoor education, you know, thinking, changing the way we're thinking about getting food to students, the changing the ways that um, we're using information technology and, and supporting that. So I, I think it might be, if it's 
I don't know how you think of, we could maybe even take one initiative project off, but kind of like lead a reflective practice where we come up with, you know, a district wide or, you know, just, you know, each district could do this on its own, but rather than having at the school level, maybe have it at a wider level where we just sit back and we think we just survived. Hopefully we'll be looking at the way out of the situation we're in, but it's very likely we'll still be in it. And what are the lessons we've learned over the past, um, you know, six to 12 months and how can we incorporate these learnings, you know, into going forward? I don't know how they're yeah. feeling about that, but those were my thoughts. So I'll, I'll listen now. Um, before I go to Mr. Harrington, that that, that was um, part of the intent between sort of that bullet and the the last bullet was was so I, I like the way that you phrased that though because it is it is bigger than just later start times. It's like what are the things that we've learned and held on to that are in new ways of doing things like you know, down to like really mundane things like approving warrants. Um, <laughs> it's like, we're doing those electronically now. And, and there's so many things that we're learning and that, that we might want to hold on to. And the, you know, what are those things that we'll want to hold on to in a post COVID world? Um, Mr. Harrington. You're muted. <laughs> There we go. There you go. I was going to say that inadvertently, uh, the Spitzer kind of pretty much answered my question. I was going to ask about like the, you know, correlation between like Desi's standards and, and guidance and our goals, but, but thank you. Thank you, Ms. Spitzer. So I, I wanted to come back to your, your, um, both, um, Ms. Dancer and Ms. Spitzer's comments about the evaluation, because um, I had the same experience. I found it really cumbersome and, and frankly, a little repetitive in writing the evaluation that we evaluated the goals within the standards and then we evaluated the goals again and then we evaluated the goals again. Um, and so it might be, when, it, I'll just plant this when we get to the agenda planning, but we might want to actually look at the instrument at the beginning of the year as opposed to waiting to the end of the year so that we have all of our experience sort of fresh in our mind as soon as we have superintendent goals um, voted on and, and agreed to, then it, you know, it might make sense to take a look at that and, and both in terms of streamlining our meetings for the rest of the year, but also um, helping us out at the end that we, we sort of know ahead of time what we're doing. Um, and as opposed to having to remember a year ago what we, <laughs> what we did. Um, on the evaluation, but I do think that there's opportunity for us to make it more efficient um, for both us um, committee members to complete, but also for the public to review and read. What other um, reactions do people have or other sort of input on sort of priority guidance for superintendent goals? Mr. Demon? Um, yeah, just to say that I like the way that um, Ms. Spitzer framed that third bullet. Yes, I did write later star times in there, but <laughs> but it was because uh, Dr. Morris um, was talking, it was from a comment Dr. Morris made a couple of meetings ago where he said, um, I'm paraphrasing, but you know, having been through COVID, even after the vaccine comes, school's never gonna be the same. And it's because we're learning and uh, and and hopefully reflecting on these things. So I think, I think I think if it if it was um, if we could sort of take that and make it a little more general about about that sort of theme, that's 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 what I was going for. Using later start times is just like the example. Um, but other than that, I see. You know, I mean, I like the if if they line up with the rubric, they're mappable. I, I like the initiative projects list there. Um, um, you know, you know, yeah. That being said, I don't know. It's 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 really tough. Um, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm almost violating my own rule that I just spoke about. Cause then I look at wellness and I'm like, what could be more important than focusing on that during this, this year. Right. Um, and yet it's not elevated as a superintendent goal, but that's okay. <laughs> um, but uh, other than that, I, I like those initi initiative projects unless we're missing something, um, major. I 
do think um, the, you know, the priority, the, so for me, when I think about it with the priority values and themes is, is you know, these are things that we expect that the superintendent and the district is working on all the time and, and continuing, I mean, like, there's no way that we would come out at the other end of the year just because we didn't have a budget goal, <laughs> budget related goal, that if, if somehow things go haywire through the year that we're not going to mention that in the evaluation just because it wasn't a goal, right? So I, I think that's sort of the way the way I, I think through these things about sort of what what qualifies as a priority value of themes is like, these are expectations that we have for a well-functioning and well-run district, school district, regardless of what the special, sp specific initiatives are that we're trying to focus on in that particular year. I like the way, Dr. Morris, you characterized it, that we really want things that we really want to be able to dig into and, and, and really focus our attention on throughout the year. Because we're not gonna not have a budget presentation or a capital plan presentation through the year just because it's not a goal. <laughs> um, Ms. Spitzer, you had your hand up. I guess I, I guess just when so if these priority values and themes, I'm just recognizing that they don't like include academic excellence. And you know, I I'm not saying so I guess I'm just trying to figure out the line where something should be on here and is it necessarily a goal and the line like would somebody call us out and be like you're a school and you haven't maybe that's just part of our mission is to educate everybody so that's why we're not including it which i'd be fine with i'm just curious about like what people were thinking of when they tried to do, kind of determine what's up here and and are we going to be tying these then and this is can be a later conversation as you said we're talking about building the instrument i'm just thinking you know having gone through the process of creating the instrument are we going to try to tie these then to the DESI rubric? Or are these like, the, the nice thing is we don't need to worry about tying these to the rubric and maybe we can just have these as things at the end that we're um, evaluating independent of the rubric. I, I think that, I don't know if other folks want to answer in drafting it. I mean, we can add things to this. This is not carved in stone, the, the conversation to, you know, right now is to add things. So, um, the I think at least that was my my thought process. Where like we, you know, academic excellence and our mission statement and vision statement holds true without us even calling out. This would sort of be the like the next layer down. So here's our vision. Here's our priority values and themes about you know that are related to that in, in our impl implementing our vision, our working towards the vision. And then these initiatives and projects are the specific activities that we're doing in this particular school year um, that we're really focusing on. Sort of like a, you know, waterfall or a ladder. Go ahead, Ms. Spitzer. I guess the only one I'm kind of looking at and, and thinking about is, is if we were thinking about in the time of COVID, I mean, like the biggest thing I'm worried about not the biggest, I mean, there's so many worries right now, but one of the big things I'm worried about is um, just the loss of um, learning time. And so I'm wondering if we should maybe call that out in the priority values and themes is just like, especially in terms of the achievement gap and, and how that there's might be, so it could sort of be in a diversity equity piece, but I'm just thinking like, we're not, like, like the, we've just had a huge disruption in learning. And, and I think we want to try to, to the extent possible, we can try to do everything we can to 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 address that. Um, might be another bullet, but I, I'm also happy to think of that as being part of our, our mission. But it might be worth calling out that this is years particularly challenging one for them. Right. Yeah. And I, and I think that sort of that it's it's that one's probably a multi-year also thinking about that maybe it, because this year it would be learning and addressing and assessing what the you know where 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 students have fallen backwards and putting in the plan that partly will be addressed this year but also in future years because it's not we're not going to be able to solve it all in 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 this year as we're in our hybrid sort of situation. Dr. Morris. 
something I should have said at the offset, perhaps, and, and maybe you said it and, and, and I missed it, but just explicitly is this feedback super helpful to me and hopefully it's super helpful to the committee because uh, according to policy, what would happen is that any feedback that the group gathers um, can be taken into a, perhaps a revised draft that actually gets voted by the committee. Um, some years, the committee has been really focused on taking formal votes on uh, on this, some, some years perhaps less so, but it is... I actually think it's a good practice, in my personal opinion. Uh, it's helpful to me as a superintendent um, that you have this kind of dialogue. Um, certainly, people can share their opinions with the chairs after the meeting um, if if they want to, if they think about it. Uh, and then this gets voted formally, and then that then it makes the goal writing exercise. It just aligns it with where the committee is. Um, so I just I, I'm doing process things multiple times tonight <laughs> out of order. So I apologize, but I just wanted to clarify that piece. I know it was sort of mentioned earlier, but hopefully that's helpful. Thank you. That is helpful. Any other, like, what other thoughts, reactions do folks have? I'm looking also at folks that haven't been speaking, if there's, um, if you have ideas that you want to be adding. Mr. Harrington? So I don't have, have much that I would want to add to this, but I, I did want to point out that, like, so in my little research prior to this, getting myself familiarized with uh, the whole process. I, and I would recommend every other new person on, on the committee do this. De Desi has some pretty interesting videos about this. I, I think some folks on this call would find the videos very interesting. Like, I, I guess, spoiler alert, some of you guys are in the video. But yeah, I, I can post a link to that in the comments here. <laughs> it, was, it was awesome. Mr. Menino? Mr. Harrington, would you post those links, please? <laughs> Any other ads uh, from anybody else? I'm looking um, at uh, Ms. Seeger and Mr. Sullivan, Ms. Kenny. Ms. Barlow, Ms. Hall. No? Okay. Ms. Kenny, sorry. <laughs> I looked away probably right when your hand went up. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's okay. Um, so I really like the um, idea of having one of the projects or initiatives be a reflection period about what has worked and what hasn't worked. And I think there have been some things that have been really great that have come out of COVID that we could keep and continue to implement. And um, and I think, I think being able to um, have some time to look at those and talk about them would be great. Um, and then I think the diversity, equity, and inclusion. I think we can also add parts of the wellness into there um, because I think that will be, there's a lot of wellness that comes into equity or lack thereof um, that I think would be good too. Um, Ms. Lord, did you, I apologize that I, couldn't see you and didn't look for you. Did you have anything you wanted to add to this? No, no, thank you. I was just, my screen keeps going black, I'm sorry. That's okay. Ms. Seeger. I don't have much to add um, and I'm just interested in watching how this all comes together being that this is my first time on this committee um, or first round on this, I don't know. Uh, what I, I just want to say too, I really like the idea of a reflection period um, in in thinking about what's what what is going well and what we've actually had a chance to consider um, changing up during this time period and, and how to bring that forward. So I just want to say I really like it too. Dr. Morris. Yeah, it's it's an it's it's a really interesting point, and, and you've heard me say it before that you know going back to exactly how things were before. Um, 
in many ways. I can think of that in terms of anti-racism. I can think of that in terms of probably start time. Um, if we had a panel of middle school and high schoolers on, I think they, they would not endorse a return to 745. So I want to support Mr. Demley's concept that there's something there to be talked about, whether we can resolve the Logistical challenges is a different question. Um, you know, we think about some of the infrastructure changes we've made at some of the other, some of our elementary schools in Amherst. Um, it's going to cause problems. I can't see going back. I can't see reinstituting partial walls and hallways to get to bathrooms. And um, and I also, you know, and you've also heard me say this before. I tend to be, uh, I'm generally an optimistic person. I'm, um, I am a little pessimistic that we'll be out of the woods on this super soon, especially when we think about vaccines being designed for adults and not necessarily for kids. And, um, you know, I, I, don't, I think this is a long haul kind of thing. Um, so I, I'm really taken by the idea of um, actually engaging in dialogue routinely with the committee about what we're learning. Cause it, I think otherwise we can just all get super busy as we've been and pick up little nuggets like I just shared. But I think there's some deeper points to be had. Um, We've had a surprising number of students uh, and families, and I don't mean it's like a huge percentage, but it's more than I would have thought, who are actually really liking distance learning, not because of a health and safety, um, but they're just, they're, for a whole host of reasons, it's working really well for them. That's not an outcome I would have predicted in May, right? Uh, I don't think many people were there in May, but I think because it's, it is going much better, we're having students... Um, who uh, are saying, you know, I'm not sure when this is generally not phase one kids, but phase two or three, you know, I may want to stay with virtual longer. And it's not because I'm nervous about or, or have feelings about the health and safety or concerns. It's actually, this is working well for me. And I wouldn't have thought of that. So I do think having some routine around that, um, and I'm thinking about, you know, could that even be a goal? I think it's worthwhile because we're 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 uh, we're so in the midst of it. We maybe you know I find I will. I'll just speak for myself. I'm so in the midst of it. It's sometimes hard to step back and consider all these statements and things we're learning. I'm learning and and think about long term implications. But I think it'll be a lost opportunity if we don't if I don't do a good job or we don't collectively uh, do some real work on that. So I just appreciate that perspective because it's not most most people don't have goals to reflect. Right. You know, it's not it's not in the education world anyway. We're we talk about reflection more than we're able to do it because we're we're often doing so many things. And I don't think it's just education, but certainly I can speak to that field. So I, you know, I want to mull on that one, but I, I think it's a really important point. Um, because the world's not going to be the same and why if the world's not going to be the same, how how would earth would we expect the schools to be the same uh, afterwards? So I think, you know, three years from now, uh, we'll be really happy if we do a really good job with that. And I think that when we think about goals, we're not just thinking of them as being so temporal, but having long-term impacts on, on our students. So mm -hmm. just want to appreciate that perspective. Any other thoughts, comments? Not seeing any, and um, as as Dr. Morris uh, suggested, um, feel free to email um, myself and and Ms. Hall afterward if you if, if there's other um, ideas or um, comments you'd like to add to this. Um, okay, moving on to our next. Um, this actually does lead very nicely into our next um, agenda item, which is agenda planning and school committee calendar. Um, so we will be meeting um, next Tuesday, um, at least as the region with an executive session, um, as well as a um, meeting. Do we have the full calendar of meetings for the year or no dr morris yeah so a couple of things i mean for uh, next week uh the things i have are negotiations as you mentioned uh the policy that was discussed tonight um the perhaps the continuation of, and vote on the document you all just talked about and offered feedback on um uh, there's a bus conversation that needs to be had uh, around bus contract and adjustments based on um, the adjustments to transportation. Um, and I guess, so that's on the short term. On the longer term, the question is, 
do we want to revert revert has a negative connotation so i don't know how to say this differently how do we want to structure you know the three committees meeting schedules um seems like next week there might be some crossover items um uh in terms of the particularly around the um the goals document and perhaps the policy but particularly you know this um thing document that would lead to goals um i'm open to whatever works for the committees um you know i think we have, have had to intersperse some amherst meetings and some Pella meetings in there um, just because topics are relevant. Um, I don't want to assume that we'll stay in this. I don't want to make assumptions about what we want, but we're, I guess we're looking for some feedback from the committees on what you would all want to do in terms of um, structure. And then we can build a calendar that we could bring at, at any committee's next meeting. It's a great question. Um, it's funny, I was, I, I stumbled on a, on a page on the agenda's website looking at archives, and I don't even know how I did there, but I noticed that in some past years that most of the year was joint meetings of the three committees. So I, I didn't know, not being a history, um, local, yes, local school committee history buff, I didn't know what, if there was a reason that was driving that, but I did see that there actually is um, a history that a lot of meetings were joint. So. Um, I guess from my perspective, particularly speaking, um, just completely biased from an Amherst um, member perspective, because all Amherst members are also all members of the region, there is some um, efficiency in many cases to having the joint meetings, um, particularly if we're continuing with the sixth grade goal. Um, so there, that and then this reflection um, you know, whatever COVID changes where we embed into, into the goals that will also continue throughout the year um, to probably be well served by joint meetings. Um, I, what do other folks feel? Chair, um, Chair Hall and then um, Mr. Menino? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. It seems like over the past several months, we've shown that we can be pretty flexible and adjust our schedules as needed. Um, so I don't, I don't necessarily like the idea of assuming an entire year of all joint meetings. Um, and then to try to determine what today, whether or not say April would, we would have a joint meeting that like that would be really challenging. Um, so, I mean, I don't know. I mean, maybe there isn't a really specific meeting schedule, at least not yet. It seems like there's so much up in the air do we have to have it written out? Is that something that has to happen? Back to Morris. Yeah, and I think for me, just maybe uh, respond to that comment, we could try to create a schedule of weekly meetings on Tuesdays. Um, and that way, at least it's predictable for the public and for you all. And if we don't need a meeting, we won't have a meeting. If Pelham doesn't need to be there, we won't call for it. We've been reasonably effective, in my opinion, of when Pelham and Amherst needs a meeting, either doing it on the front end or the back end. Um, you know, usually the front end for Pelham and the back end for Amherst, front end for Pelham, because not all Pelham members may stay on for the rest, and back end for Amherst, because unfortunately, as Ms. McDonald noted, well, perhaps you disagree, but unfortunately, the committee members are going to be there anyway. Um, so there's no conflict with doing an Amherst meeting on the back end. But I think just what, what I'm hearing from members as well as the public is just wanting to have some predictability and reliability of, um, and even if we just created a schedule and, and try to plug in some agenda items for the next two months or something, knowing that we'll adjust, you know, I think that probably satisfies thing. I wouldn't go to April because I don't, you know, who knows? Uh, your guess is as good as mine on that one. Um, I don't know how that feels for yeah. folks. I, I I do like that, and I think it's you know having the um, that assumption that we that we just put them on the calendar and, and flex as as needed, um, at least for the next four months ish. Um, once we get to budget planning that we may need to break into separate meetings more frequently at that point because that gets into the needs. Um, I see two hands, Mr. Menino and Ms. Stancer. Mr. Menino? Uh, not against joint meetings, but there are times where the issues are unique to Pelham and the joint meeting mitigates against us talking about that in greater depth. Uh, and I would not like to give up the opportunity to talk about Pelham when Pelham meets, 
basically. Uh, it, it focuses the attention on our problems. And I prefer to, like the last four years, we've had uh, meetings separately than uh, joint meetings, and I think it's gone well. So just experience this, that the old model works. Uh, but I'm not against joint meetings. Ms. Stancer? Okay. <laughs> okay. So we have, it sounds like we have at least next week's agenda set, and it sounds like there are uh, two region topics, the negotiations, the policy. Um, so Amherst and, and Pelham are part of, part of the policy, even though technically region votes first and then the others. Um, but that can be joint. And then the goals, guidance, and vote, and transportation would also would be joint. Is that? OK. Great. Any other? Um, Agenda, Mr. Deming. Oh, yeah. uh, so the first quarter budget update uh, would be it will be interesting, <laughs> but we definitely need to start thinking about that. Um, uh, school committee resolution or advocacy thing on on the MLC, the minimum local contribution study, hold harmless, uh, and all that. Um, I also, this isn't really fully formed and I don't want to advocate for it during planning, but I would like to discuss some level of potential ag, if the committee wants to have some potential level of ad, advocacy or action regarding some kind of a motion asking the UMass Chancellor to add consequences for student violations of the UMass Community Agreement, um, given, given its direct impact on our ability to keep our schools open going forward. Okay, anything? Ms. Spitzer. Just one thing about this planning. Um, I think election day is a Tuesday, so I'm hoping that we wouldn't have a, a meeting on that evening, um, Tuesday the 3rd, and then uh, November 3rd. And then the other additional thing I was thinking is at some point, and kind of going to Mr. Menino's point, it, it would love to have on the Amherst agenda when it's appropriate, an update on the school building project, and um, mm -hmm. just brief update. Miss Dancer, sorry, I'm calling in with my phone for the audio, and every so often it decides that it doesn't want to do it anymore. Um, so, I, two things about the joint versus individual. I guess I. Having been just on Pelham and having been on the region, I see advantages to both ways, but right now, I think if we were only, if, if Pelham wasn't included in what's going on, I think we would really be left out. Um, the Pelham meetings, there's a lot more information that comes out of the regional meeting than, than you get in the Pelham meeting. And it's not always necessary, but I personally find it helpful to have a little bit more context on things sometimes. So just my two cents. Okay. Not seeing any more. Uh, nope. Okay. Um, great. So we'll move on to our next item, which is a warrant report. And I have one. Um, I don't know, Miss Spitzer, if you have one as well. Okay. So. Um, Sorry, Chair McDonald. I have two. Can I do those after you guys do yours? Yes. Thank you. Um, Okay, so I have mine right here. Um, I authorized by my signature to payables in the amount of $696,434.76. The warrant dated um, September 25th, 2020. This includes general fund expenses, 
of $453,825.45, revolving fund expenses of $10,522.33, grant fund expense of $8,103.47, FEMA fund of $142,993.17, CARE fund, which I'm guessing is the CARES Act fund, um, $80,990.34. Uh, $80, and I signed that today. Ms. Spitzer. So um, I authorized by my signature to payables in the amount of $230,351.99 for the warrant dated September 23rd, 2020. This included general fund expenses of $144,083.85, $5,929.27, sorry, that was revolving fund expenses of that amount, grant fund expenses of $69,220.67, and other funds in the amount of $11,118.20, um, and those funds were for capital, and this was um, signed on September 25th. I also authorized by my signature to payables in the amount of $790,438.59 for the warrant dated September 25th, 2020. And this included general fund expenses of that amount exclusively. And that was signed on um, September 27th, 2020. And that's all I have. Okay, Ms. Hoff. Okay, I authorized by my signature to payables in the amount of $49,176.35 for the warrant dated September 3rd, 2020. This included general fund expenses of $39,704.06 and grant fund expenses of $9,472.29. And I signed that one on um, September 4th. And I authorized by my signature to payables in the amount of $33,191.39 for the warrant dated September 18th, 2020. That included general fund expenses of $30,561.93, revolving fund expenses of $135.46, grant fund expenses of $2,494. And I signed that one on September 21st. And that's all. Um, and uh, moving on, we have gifts, and I don't think we have any gifts tonight. Nope. Okay. So, um, item number 13. Would somebody from Amherst like to make a motion? I move to adjourn the Amherst School Committee. Second. Moved by Spitzer and second by Harrington. There's no discussion. Um, Mr. Demling. I'm just going to delay for seven minutes so that we can't end on time. Now, doubling eye. <laughs> um, Mr. Harrington. Harrington, I. Ms. Lord. Lord, I. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, I. And McDonald, I. We are adjourned. And I will note, actually, we were supposed to have adjourned at 8.35, so we're actually late. <laughs> Chair Hall. All right, would someone from Pelham like to make a motion? Uh, I move to adjourn the Pelham School Committee. All right, moved by Barlow. Second. Seconded by Kenny. All right, we'll take a roll call vote. Uh, Ms. Kenny. Kenny, aye. Ms. Barlow. Barlow, aye. Mr. Menino. Menino, aye. Ms. Stancer. Stancer, aye. And Hall, aye. Pelham is adjourned. And I will move to adjourn the Regional School Committee. Is there a second? Lord second. Moved by McDonald, second by Lord. And there's no discussion. Roll call vote. Mr. Demling. Demling, aye. Mr. Harrington. Harrington, aye. Ms. Kenny. Kenny, aye. Ms. Lord. Lord, aye. Ms. Seeger. Seeger, aye. Ms. Spitzer. Spitzer, aye. Ms. Spencer. Spencer, aye. Mr. Sullivan. Sullivan, aye. And McDonald, aye. The region is adjourned. 
Thank you, Amherst Media, and thank you, everybody.